Good evening. My name is Fran Foster. I'm a past master of Setucket Lodge in East Bridgewater. With me tonight is Right Worshipful Ara Manugian, past master of Puritan Lodge of Whitman, a past district deputy of the Brockton 29th Masonic District, and a member of the Grand Lodge Education Department in Boston. Uh, Ara, maybe you could tell our audience some of the different departments that are in Grand Lodge? Yes, Franny. There are several. Uh, one is, of course, the Education Department. Uh, another one is the Service Department. The Service Department is probably one of the most important ones because it deals with blood co collections. All the Masonic Lodges in our state with the Red Cross sponsor blood banks. And they uh, have drives every three or four months whenever they can make the arrangements with uh, the Red Cross. Uh, normally they have either a brunch or a breakfast which is uh, for the uh, donees. Na uh, statewide, our Grand Lodge, uh, through their sponsorship of the blood banks, collects over 20,000 pints of blood a year. Uh, we are the top blood getter, so to speak, in the state. Uh, another uh, program that the uh, service department has is our uh, hospitalization, visitation in our veterans hospitals. Uh, in our own district here, uh, the Brockton, of course we have the VA hospital in Brockton, and every week one of the lodges in the district out of the eight uh, send volunteers to the hospital in order to escort uh, patients to the uh, chapel services. Uh, this is uh, been in service about 25 years now. And I think all the members are quite proud of what they do. Uh, it makes you feel a lot better after you've gone and seen some of our veterans and uh, you count your blessings. Yes, I know. I'm very pleased to be able to go up there and escort them to, pay, to uh, for chapel service. A good many times, this is the only time that they see a person from mm -hmm. the outside world. And they have done so much and given up so much for us. True. Uh, some of them uh, do not have any families at all, and others might have families, but they might live a uh, five or six hour drive away, so they, it's difficult for them to, to visit. Uh, it really cheers them up, and they look forward to getting out of the ward, even if it's only for an hour or so. Uh, another uh, part of the, not necessarily the service, but uh, the uh, Grand Lodge in this state and uh, quite a few of the others have Masonic homes uh, which uh, are open to all members, their wives, uh, their uh, offsprings, uh, in-laws, mother-in-law, father-in-law. It's a very, very beautiful place. It's located in Charlton, as you well know. Oh, yeah. It's really a nice place to visit even for people who uh, do not belong to our fraternity. It's uh, beautiful grounds. I would recommend to go uh, someday in the summer and bring a picnic uh, lunch with you because they have very nice areas where you can picnic. Uh, they'll give you a tour of the home and the, the, the whole facility, in fact. The, uh, out of the 50 states, and this is not only our Grand Lodge, but out of the 50 states uh, uh, in uh, the United States, and there are 50 Grand Lodges, uh, I would say probably about 35 of them have either a Masonic home for members and their families. Uh, some of them, uh, where the uh, Grand Lodges are big enough to be able to afford it, have uh, homes for children, orphanages. Uh, New York, in particular, has a uh, research hospital uh, I think they do mostly research on geriatrics. They're, uh, s some of them that do not have uh, homes and uh, orphanages do have uh, charity funds where they can help members who are uh, in need at the time. And another one of our uh, departments is our library and our museum. 
very, very interesting, not only for members again, but for uh, any uh, non-Mason and their wives. Uh, there are tours which would be, uh, you would be guided through the building. There are some nice artifacts to see in the museum. For example, one of them is uh, Tom Thumb's uh, Masonic apron. Uh, another is a lock of hair from George Washington, uh, which was donated to our Grand Lodge uh, by his widow after he passed away. And that is contained in a small uh, brass vase, which was made by none other than Paul Revere, who was one of our past Grand Masters. Wasn't Paul Revere one of the, the Grand Master that gave the charter to Fellowship Lodge down in Bridgewater That's in 1797. Right. That's right. In fact, uh, at the, he probably chartered about 20 lodges during the term that he was a Grand Master. And a lot of those lodges are uh, going to be celebrating their, I think, 200th anniversaries, if I'm not mistaken. Well, 1797, yeah. And right. Next so year. Next year. Yeah. Right. One of them is, in fact, down in Provincetown. And I understand there is a group of Masons from our area are going to go down and help them celebrate. Uh, the other uh, affiliated uh, museum would be the Scottish Rite Museum in Lexington of our American heritage. Uh, they have uh, different displays uh, all through the, uh, throughout the whole year. Very, very interesting. I uh, would recommend to everybody that can to go down and take a tour of it. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of uh, history and heritage uh, of our very own there. You mentioned blood a few moments ago. Uh, we're both from the Tritown Temple, Puritan Lodge and Setucket Lodge. To put in a plug, we have a blood drive coming up in June. So if anybody can uh, and is willing to give an hour and a pint of blood, we'd be welcome to have you show up. And you would get a free breakfast and a free lunch, of right. course. That would be an inducement for some of us. Sure. But uh, that's another thing that makes you feel good, that you were able to donate a pint of blood that didn't cost you any money, and you most surely did save a life someplace. Sure. Uh, Masonic Charities has been well known uh, throughout Massachusetts and throughout the world. Uh, Masonic Charities give more than $2 million a day to the various charitable uh, organizations that they support. I'm wondering if you could tell our audience a few of those organizations and, and uh, who runs them. Yes, Fran. Uh, these are all either directly Masonic or Masonic affiliated. In other words, you have to be a Mason to join that particular organization. I think the most famous one that is known by most everybody is the Shriners Burns Institute. And uh, they have a hospital right here in Boston. And they also have a crippled children hospital in Springfield. Mm -hmm. I think they have something like uh, probably 100, 150 hospitals throughout the country, both in Burns and crippled children. The Burns Institute uh, is at the uh, Mass, Mass General Hospital. Uh, it is uh, open to all children up to the year uh, age of 18 years old for the admittance part. But you may go beyond the year uh, age of 18 because you're receiving treatment. They're not going to drop you from the program. Uh, there is no charge for this treatment. And this is open to everybody? Open to everybody. You do not have to be a Mason or the offspring of a Mason. All you need is a recommendation from a Mason who is a Shriner. And that is very easy enough to find out oh, yeah. who is. They also have their crippled children's hospital, as I mentioned, in Springfield. And they do some wonderful work there. Uh, I saw a movie not too long ago that they have a presentation they make. And they had a young lad who was uh, born uh, without any arms. And they showed him playing at home for us in the... Uh, the uh, movie they had, and it showed him sitting down with no shoes on, and he was picking up toys, and he'd pick up a cracker with his feet and eat it, and he had, his arms were like flippers. Uh, uh -huh. So his parents had applied, and he was accepted to go to the 
Crippled Children's Hospital. And for this particular young lad, the first requirement was the parents were told you have to buy him shoes because we don't want him to be using his feet. We're going to fit him with prosthetics, and we want him to get used to using the prosthetics. Mm -hmm. And it showed uh, him entering the hospital, and it showed him being fitted for his prosthetic, and as he was learning to use them, and it showed him like six months down the road, and looked like any other normal boy playing with toys and picking up a banana and eating it and so forth. That's great. It is, and that, again, is no charge. Uh, the family does not even have to uh, show a statement of financial need. And a good many times they will find accommodations for the family in and around the area, won't they, so that they can be close to the child? Yes, they can do that. Yes. Uh, not on a long-term basis, but on, for visitations on a weekend no. and so forth. Uh, uh, the Scottish Rite has the crippled children, the, the not the crippled children, the Learning Disabilities Center. Yes, that they, they just they opened with. one up recently, and they're going to open a second one in uh, Massachusetts. And these are designed for, as you said, learning disabilities. Uh, again, this is a no charge, uh, no fee involved, and they're doing some wonderful work. Uh, they were, they have been more active uh, in other parts of the country and it is slowly spread over here and we're kind of picking up the ball and following through here also. The uh, Knights Templar, which is also known as the Commandery, have the Eye Foundation and they do some wonderful work. Uh, they'll do it with adults but mostly with children. Uh, they corrections on eye problems, for example, cross mm -hmm. eyes and things like that. <coughs> Excuse me. There also uh, are other charities that a lot of the other bodies run. I'm not familiar with all of them. Being more active in Grand Lodge, I'm more, more familiar with them, of course. Uh, yeah. <laughs> all right, some of the other charities. Uh, the Alzheimer's Research? Yes, uh, I believe uh, that might be with the Grottos. And the grottos are similar to the uh, shrine. Well, a lot of people know the shrine because they see them in parades with the fezes yep. on and the clowns. Uh, and the grotto is another organization very similar to that. Uh, but they have the serious side. And I think that's what keeps the members going more than uh, they enjoy doing the fun part. But uh, it's more of an inspiration when you're helping the children. Uh, I've been trying to get the grotto on uh, on one of the shows. Uh, I know nothing about it, and the people that I've talked to uh, don't seem to know much about it either. Uh, the grotto is what? The fun organization of the masonry, is it? Uh, That's right. That would be considered the fun organization, as I mentioned, similar to the uh, Shriners. Okay. But the grottos are more on a local base. You'll find more grottos around in... Uh, centers like, say, Brockton or Fall River or Quincy, whereas the uh, Shrine, there's a unit uh, in, uh, for Boston, there's one out in Springfield, and I think that's the only two Shrine units uh, in this state. We also donate to the Crotchet Mountain Crippled Children? Crotchet Mountain is done through the Royal Arts Chapters, and we also have the Eastern Star. They do a, a lot of charitable work uh, for cancer research. They also have uh, scholarships as our own Grand Lodge does, mm -hmm. which they started this year. The uh, one for the Eastern Star is primarily for students who are going into uh, theological seminaries to study for the ministry. Okay, uh, we, we mentioned uh, a little, few moments ago the Grand Lodge Library. This has been said to be one of the uh, most, the premier libraries of Masonic collections in the world. Uh, people come from all over the country to come to this library. Uh, any Mason can uh, call in and get a book sent to them uh, just by uh, proving, or not proving, but stating their lodge and the lodge affiliation, and then the library will send out the books or yes. tapes. Yeah. Uh, it is uh, quite an extensive library, as you said. 
and it's probably the second or third premier library, Masonic library, uh, in the country. Uh, one thing in particular with our library at Grand Lodge here in Massachusetts, there is a lot of material in there related to the uh, Revolutionary War because there were so many Masons, uh, for example, Paul Revere, John Hancock, that were so involved in the Revolution and they were so involved in Masonry that we have a tremendous amount of information about them and anybody doing any research or study on the Revolutionary War would be remiss not to go there and, and get some of their information. Uh, there are claims that uh, the Boston Tea Party, for one yes. item, was, uh, uh, it's not written in our records, but there is a lodge in Boston that uh, recessed their meeting, and like an hour or two later, the Boston Tea Party happened mm -hmm. with so-called quote-unquote Indians uh, throwing the bales of tea over in Boston Harbor, and then the meeting was reconvened two or three hours after that incident. From Pale Face Indians. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so there was quite a bit of activity. Uh, of course, Paul Revere was known for his uh, famous ride to uh, uh, announce or broadcast the word that the British were coming. Uh, and he went all the way to Lexington and Concord and so forth. Uh, George Washington, uh, another Mason who was very, very active in the uh, uh, Revolutionary War. Uh, we have a lot of correspondence that he uh, had directed to our Grand Lodge, uh, another very, very famous American. And I would say next to George Washington, I would consider him the most famous American there is, and that is Benjamin Franklin. He had, uh, and he was one of our, call him a Boston boy, because he was born and brought up here in Boston, and uh, he uh, left his brother's printing business and went to Pennsylvania. Uh, but he, I think his heart was always back here in Massachusetts, particularly with the Masonic tie. Uh, there are, again, uh, a lot of communications that you can find at the library that he had with uh, members of our Grand Lodge. It, it is said that half the signers of the Independence, Declaration of Independence, were Masons. Well, that's kind of stretching the truth, and, you uh, know, we all like to brag, but uh, probably, uh, I would say, 19... Uh, of the uh, signees of the Con uh, Declaration and the Constitution were Masons. Uh, in fact, our uh, Masonic structure, politically uh, speaking, is followed uh, quite a bit by how our political structure of our country is. Uh, we're, we, each Grand Lodge is independent unto itself, uh, uh, as our states are. Mm -hmm. uh, our patriots in the beginning, beginning were very, very uh, home rule type of men. Uh, it was quite a job to get them uh, to become a federation and form a United States. Uh, Benjamin Franklin was quite active in convincing a lot of those members uh, to do that. Wasn't there a move underfoot uh, back in the early years to uh, make a national Grand Lodge and make uh, George Washington the leader of it, and he said, no way, it's not going to happen. It's all going to be the individual states. That's right, Fran. Uh, and he did the same thing for, uh, for the country. He wanted, uh, they, they wanted him to run again for president, and of course he refused it. And there was a uh, national so-called Masonic Convention in uh, Washington in the early 1800s, and they wanted to form a national Grand Lodge, and they wanted to elect uh, brother and President George Washington as our uh, Supreme Grand Master, but he refused it, uh, mostly I think on the basis that he was afraid that we might end up uh, like England, have a royalty, a, a monarchy, mm -hmm. uh, and it, it's a good, he, he was quite uh, foresightful, uh, if that's the right word, uh, in doing what he did. I think he did a good job. Uh, masonry uh, is said to have been around at the time of King Solomon. Uh, there's been Masonic references to the Egyptians, uh, the Knights Templar, uh, the Knights of the Crusades are said to have been Masons. Uh, goes way, way back. 
But nobody knows anything about this because there were no written records kept. Uh, John J. Robinson did a lot of research on uh, the origins of masonry, and he has written some fantastic books, which can be obtained from the Grand Lodge Library. Uh, Born in Blood is one of them. Uh, Pilgrim's Path is another. Uh, John Robinson was not a mason at the time when he wrote these books uh, to lend credence to his research. But uh, he wrote the books, which are excellent, excellent reading, and give a lot of insight into the origins, what they believe to be masonry. Mm -hmm. uh, he, uh, on writing the books, thought so well of masonry that he became a mason, and he was given his degrees on his deathbed. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, friend, on uh, bringing our origins back to King Solomon, uh, I think it's kind of wishful thinking on, on some of our brethren's part. But we did take a lot of uh, the lessons uh, from the building of King Solomon's temple and applied them so, as moral lessons uh, for our fraternity. The earliest records, uh, written records that uh, are available uh, date back to around 1500. And these were mostly uh, guilds of stonemasons who would uh, travel from country to country to build cathedrals and so forth. They were, at the time, the only people that were allowed to uh, travel uh, to foreign countries. Most, uh, all the people that were born in the village, uh, were born there, raised there, worked there, and they died there. They were not allowed to travel uh, as we are, for example, uh, today in this country. So they formed these guilds to have somebody back home watch for their families in case they should mm -hmm. not return because of death or illness or whatever. And as time evolved, of course, the cathedral building slowed down and there was not need uh, for as many stonemasons as there was in the beginning. And they gradually started to accept members like you and I. Uh, we might have been in salesmen or jewelers or goldsmiths mm -hmm. or whatever. And we became known as speculative masonry uh, rather than the operative masons uh, from the beginning. And then uh, in 1717, uh, there was in England, in London, four or five lodges that got together and formed a uh, Grand Lodge. They uh, grew quite rapidly, and for a while they even had a split because uh, some of the members thought that they weren't doing the things the way they should be doing, like the ancient Masons, and one called the, were called the ancients, the other the moderns. But finally, after a few years, they united. And then in uh, 1733, uh, the Grand Master from England sent a uh, warrant over to uh, Henry Price, who was our first Grand Master here. And uh, he exercised that warrant. And the uh, state of, or Grand Lodge of Massachusetts became the first Grand Lodge in the United States. There were lodges in other states and other colonies previous to that time, but they weren't banded or united together as a Grand Lodge. So we have the distinction of being the first Grand Lodge in the United States and the third oldest Grand Lodge in the world. Having before us the Grand Lodge of England, number one, uh, number two, the Grand Lodge of Ireland, and the third, the Grand Lodge of Massachusetts. And of course, we're all very proud of that. And as our country grew, masonry sped to the west. And there would be four or five Grand Lodges, for example, or four or five lodges that uh, were in, say, Rhode Island, as an example. And they would apply to Grand Lodge here in Massachusetts for a charter or uh, let her enable them to form their own Grand Lodge. And we slowly spread out to the west, all the way out to Hawaii and Alaska. In every state you go to now, you can find a Grand Lodge, and uh, it's nice. Yeah. You mentioned earlier that uh, a man grew up in his village and was raised there, 
educated there, died there. Uh, we have been called a secret society. Well, Masonry has no secrets now. Back in those days, yes, there was, there was a secret society because the Masons had the secrets of how to square the stones, how to build uh, the cathedrals. The, it was the knowledge that was kept secret to enable them to travel mm -hmm. in foreign countries, work and receive master's pay. Right. Thank you, Fran, yes. They were not, you know, they were stonemasons, but they were also architects and engineers and artisans uh, who worked in brass uh, and so forth and tiles. And as you said, they were secret because they were keeping a trade secret. And today we're not secret like that. We have our buildings with our square and compasses on them. Uh, in some states, their meetings are advertised in the paper. Uh, a lot of us wear pins, lapel pins, and rings, and so forth. Uh, the only secrets we have is uh, a secret like you and I would have in our own families. Things that we talk over with our wives or our children, we don't go out in the street and talk about it. If you belong to the Rotary, the Kiwanis, you have uh, meetings there, and the business that is transacted in there are the secrets. Uh, we have a lot of charitable works, which we're proud of. Uh, those aren't secret. No. Uh, I wear my Masonic ring. Uh, I wear it proudly. I'm proud to be a Mason. It is the nicest bunch of people that in, in the world. And you can go anywhere in the country. And as soon as you make your affiliation known, you're among friends. Right. I, uh, I, yes, friend, that's very, very true. However, we want to qualify, too, that we're not all perfect. And in every barrel of apples, you might find one or two bad ones, and uh, we know that. But, but by and large, they're all nice guys. But the bad apples don't last too long. Right, they don't. They get found out quickly. Yes. Well, you know, uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful organization, and we had a, a Lodge of Instruction speaker last night that said we must maintain the power of the hand. The power of the hand. Amen. The Thank friendship. you. Uh, you know, this is this is one of the things that has impressed me. Uh, all the people I've met, uh, that I've met throughout the the years, uh, instantly friends. Right. Uh, a good example of that is in my own family. Uh, my stepdad was a mason, and my mother always used to say, no matter where we go, whether we're on a trolley car or the subway, or on a ferry. He always meets somebody that he knows like a brother. I says, Mom, they are brothers. Yes. <laughs> well, I, I see our time is about up. Uh, Ara, thank you for coming tonight, and thank you for talking with us about Masonic Charities and the Education Department. This is Fran Foster of Satucket Lodge. Uh, thank you for watching our show. We hope to be here again and presenting some more uh, subjects of masonry uh, for your enlightenment. Thank you very much. Good night. Silicon landscapes of tomorrow's supercomputers, or as far as your ability and imagination will allow. But only if you don't bail out. So stay in school. Brought to you by the United States Air Force.